Good night, everybody. Welcome to a new uh, version of the webinar series at uh, UTEC uh, University. My name is Giancarlo Flores. I'm the chair of the Department of Civil Engineering at UTEC. And uh, today I'm uh, extremely happy to, to welcome Professor Takeshi Katsumi uh, from Japan, who is going to talk uh, with us uh, about the soil recovery from uh, disaster uh, debris, uh, lessons learned through the recovery uh, from the 2011 East Japan earthquake and tsunami. 10 years ago, Japan suffered uh, one of its uh, worst disasters of uh, recent time. Uh, 20,000 people uh, that thought of missing, more than uh, $300 uh, billion dollar in, in losses, and uh, 30 million cubic meter of uh, disaster uh, debris that had to be uh, managed. Professor Katsumi was the chair of the uh, technical committee that uh, suggested the solutions for these materials and especially what to do with the 10 million uh, cubic meter of soils. He's an uh, active member of the Japanese Geotechnical Society. Uh, he's an uh, active member of the International uh, Geosynthetics Society and he's current dean of the Department of uh, Global Environmental uh, Studies at Kyoto University in Japan. So uh, Professor Katsumi is the best person to, to share with us uh, about this experience. Uh, he's a, a former colleague of mine. And uh, actually we were in Peru at exactly the time of the Japan earthquake. And uh, we uh, heard the news from Peru and then we went back to, to Japan to work on the recovery. Professor Katsumi was uh, very uh, involved in the recovery process, and uh, he's going to share some of his experience with us today. Professor Katsumi, we are very happy to have you uh, with us here. I welcome you uh, 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 at least virtually in Peru, and uh, um, I, I'm sure uh, your presentation is going to be useful for everybody. Thank you for being here. Hi, Giancarlo. Professor Flores, thank you very much for your very kind introduction. The ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to be here, not in Peru actually, but on your PC through Zoom to deliver this presentation organized by UTEC. And this time I'm very happy to share with you about uh, the, some experience through the recovery from a 2011 uh, East Japan earthquake and tsunami. Let me share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, perfectly. Okay, thanks. Okay, yes, uh, as I, uh, Giancarlo mentioned, I belong to uh, Kyoto University and I'm currently Dean of the Graduate School of Global Environmental Studies where uh, Giancarlo studied for his PhD. So I am very happy to give a presentation uh, organized by uh, uh, Giancarlo, Professor Flores. This is the world map. I'm here in Japan and uh, you guys are uh, here uh, in Peru. And between us, we have uh, only one small ocean, which is Pacific Ocean. So therefore, it's like uh, the neighbors, uh, particularly in terms of the uh, earthquake disasters. For example, we have an earthquake in one side, we are having a tsunami at another side. So we are always concerned about the earthquake disasters each other. And this map is showing that uh, where Kyoto is located, uh, and, uh, where I have a living, in the most of life, my lifetime, and also Giancarlo spent uh, 60 years, 16 years, right? Am I right? And also Kyoto has had been a national capital for more than a thousand years before Tokyo became a capital almost uh, 150 years ago. And the city offers beautiful sites and events in all four seasons with several famous sightseeing places including 14 UNESCO World Heritage Sites, 
And uh, before COVID, it annually attracted more than 50 million domestic and international tourists. Such situation is believed to recover in the future, and I'd be happy if uh, we can meet uh, in person uh, in Peru or in Japan, uh, particularly in Kyoto. And Tokyo is our capital and the place where Olympic will be held three weeks later from now. And 10 years ago, big earthquake and tsunami hit the entire east part of Japan. The region uh, which was mostly seriously attacked by this uh, East Japan earthquake tsunami is uh, Tohoku region. Now, let me focus on this uh, region and the disaster. The earthquake hit the Tohoku a region several kilometers away from the coast in the Pacific Ocean on March 11, 2011. The run-up tsunami height uh, reached a maximum height of uh, 40 meters and about uh, more than uh, 500 square kilometers uh, land were flooded by tsunami. So today I will focus on the disaster debris, uh, which accounted for 30 million tons of waste. And we'll touch up on the nuclear accident uh, briefly if time is available. And areas affected by the disaster is characterized by some natural features. The northern part has a very beautiful rear coast that is about uh, 600 kilometers long. So if uh, you drive there, it is very beautiful. There is a hilly seashore, small towns, green mountains, not large, and blue ocean as well. And there is a, a biggest city in Tohoku region, which is called Sendai City, where the large percentage of uh, Tohoku population uh, lives. Another big issue related to the 2011 earthquake was a Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, which was located here. Actually, we had another power plant here, uh, which was also attacked by tsunami, but uh, it was uh, uh, safely shut down and did not cause any serious problems like Fukushima Daiichi. There is another nuclear power plant so like here, which is called Onagawa nuclear power plant, where it was safely shut down as well after the earthquake. Unfortunately, these nuclear power plants were located at the higher elevation compared to Fukushima nuclear power plants. So it was not attacked by tsunami. And actually the, the surrounding people evacuated into a nuclear power plant, plant to save their lives because of the elevations. So that was the situations of uh, other nuclear power plants among the three power plants they existed, existing uh, in this region. But unfortunately, we had uh, one nuclear power plant that was heavily damaged by the earthquake and tsunami and nuclear contamination occurred, not only Fukushima area, but also some parts uh, of the Southern Tohoku region. Now let me briefly talk about on the damage by town by town. Actually the, the contamination uh, was concerned no, mostly in this area, but the, these areas. So the, the first, I focus on the city of Taro, uh, which is very famous for it's a very tall uh, seawall because it was already impacted by heavy tsunami disasters in the previous time. And uh, they built a very tall seawalls to protect the town from a tsunamis. Actually, they built this part uh, first and then another part later. So the X-shaped seawall with a height of 10 meter and total length of 2.4 kilometers. But unfortunately, the height of the tsunami was uh, 37 meters uh, at this place, which easily overwhelmed the seawalls and attacked the town. 200 people which is around 5% of the residents of this town died in tsunami. So many people assumed that uh, the town must have been safe because of these uh, great walls, but that was not true. So this kind 
of uh, a wrong assumption caused a huge number of deaths among uh, the residents of Taro. Uh, the, there is another town, which is Miyako City. The reason why I selected this town is because of this photo, which was taken from the city hall building, which was also damaged by tsunami. And can you see very dark color of tsunami? The reason why it is so dark is that the tsunami transported the seabed deposit, uh, which are very black. That might maybe the evidence for the seabed contamination, because if this contamination, contaminated deposit did not exist, our tsunami water should be very clean or clear or transparent or blue. But in many locations, we have uh, this contaminated black colored tsunami water. Uh, this photo was uh, taken after the several months of uh, disaster, indicated that the road were repaired nicely uh, several months after the tsunami, while the damaged sea levees levees were still left. Another city is Ofnato. I chose this city because uh, it has a cement manufacturing plant, uh, but it was uh, heavily damaged by tsunami as well, but eventually renovated and helped in the treatment of disaster debris, which is one of the topics of my talk today. And uh, this is uh, the cement manufacturing notary kilum. This is not a kilum uh, in Ofneto, but most plants have a similar facility, which is called cement kilum or rotary kilum, which worked uh, to treat uh, the disaster debris. Rikusen Takata is another famous city because of the very beautiful pine trees, pine forests. Unfortunately, all pine trees were destroyed by tsunami. So we are no longer able to see this uh, beautiful forest. And this photo shows the situations of disaster recovery. You can see conveyor belt with uh, the bridge here. This bridge was constructed only for the transportation related to the disaster recovery. So it was uh, uh, operated only for, for two or three years. So it's like a temporary facility, but it was developed for the disaster recovery to effectively transport uh, the soils from uh, the, this side to another side. There is a reason why this kind of a big conveyor belt bridge was constructed is to transport the excavated soils, but not using uh, normal existing loads uh, existed here. Uh, this is a flooded area by tsunami and mountain cutting were uh, conducted there. So the soils were transported, uh, mountain cut soils are transported from this side to another side. And people might think that uh, there were existing traditional laws that uh, we could uh, have used uh, to transport this soil using trucks. However, it is not good. If uh, you can, you imagine huge amount of uh, the, the soil transportations by truck uh, over the bridge, uh, it will cause it would cause uh, the large numbers of trans tra truck transportations and uh, significantly reduce the uh, uh, durability of the bridge and also traffic jams. So therefore, they have decided to build this kind of uh, the conveyor belt bridge only for transportation of the excavated soils for disaster recovery. This is an example of what they have done for the disaster recovery. Okay. This is the photo taken at the Sendai Plain right after the earthquake and before tsunami attacked this area. You see black uh, colored soils here. Uh, from which we recognize that uh, the, this region is the requefaction. And uh, after a few minutes, a tsunami attacked uh, these areas. Therefore, we are not able to see these requefied soils because everything was washed away. So we are not able to examine uh, which areas were liquefied 
and uh, which are not. But fortunately, this time, many people have my mobile phones and uh, took photos and videos at any time of the disaster. And these data can be accumulated, stored, and utilized for the, uh, the later investigation of uh, what the disaster looks like as shown in this photo. And I'm a geotechnical engineer, and I'm interested in uh, the, these liquefied uh, soils. But if we talk with other people, for example, agriculture or forestry people, if we focus on uh, these trees, uh, you see these trees are stable and standing despite the tsunami, unlike uh, houses uh, which are washed uh, away uh, by tsunami. And some houses were even washed away by tsunami. And uh, many trees were uh, but still resistant against the tsunami. Of course, some trees are uh, washed away, severely damaged. But even these trees uh, which were resistant tsunami uh, were damaged by the salt from the seawater and died as a result several weeks later or several months later even after the disaster. But at the time, of the tsunami attack. These trees were resistant and uh, contributed to reducing the tsunami energy. So we can recognize that uh, the seaside forests were very effective in reducing the impact of a disaster to the backlands. Okay, so these are the overviews of the disasters. So let me briefly talk about uh, what happened in this area during the tsunami. And uh, let me focus on the, the, the geoenvironmental issues. The, there are three issues. First, uh, the, there are a huge amount of disaster debris. So the, uh, we should uh, uh, focus on the, the treatment of disaster debris. Particularly, we had uh, a huge amount of soils uh, which should uh, be expected to be recovered uh, for the utilization. And there are two issues regarding the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant accidents. One is the uh, geotechnical issues uh, contributing to the decommissioning of the damaged the nuclear power plants. So because uh, the time is limited and there are many issues, I'm not uh, able to touch on this uh, topic. And there is another issue, which is uh, the, the contaminated soils, which are uh, distributed uh, mainly in the Fukushima area. And there is uh, many stories and uh, still, still ongoing uh, projects, uh, but uh, possibly due to the limited time, I'm not able to uh, talk about uh, this issue in detail. So let me focus on the disaster debris and recover the soils. So the, what's the status of the disaster waste and its treatment? The, the top right picture shows the situation right after the disaster and the bottom photo shows the disaster debris at the temporary storage sites. The Japanese government has decided to conduct the disaster waste treatment the purpose of this treatment is uh, first we have to secure the, the environment and uh, uh, we have to secure the human health and conditions which are sanitary issues. And the second purpose is uh, the, the, the fast and proper the recovery from the disaster. Therefore treatment of disaster waste is necessary. We might think that uh, dumping all the disaster waste in landfill sites is easier, but Japan has a history the, of uh, the waste reduction and waste disposal is a big issue in Japan. So there are purposes to and important aspects that we have to consider. But there are characteristics and features uh, to, waste, to the waste from the 2011 disaster. The first, the waste is not homogeneous, but a mixture of various materials. Tsunami mixed uh, everything together. So the waste genera generated by tsunami was uh, quite different from uh, 
waste or from generated by the earthquake disasters. They are the mixtures. And second feature is the huge amount of the disaster debris produced by the disaster due to the large area impacted by tsunami. And as I mentioned in previous slides in Miyako City, tsunami transported uh, uh, the uh, seabed soils. Therefore, large amount of soils is included in the, this waste mixture. So the basic policy of disaster debris treatment was uh, the separation, incineration, and the reuse. And this was conducted over three years period in many places. However, the reuse of the soil portion of the disaster debris proved to be a challenging because such recovered soils have never been conducted and used in construction works. And it was expected that such soil will be reused. So the, this, this was a big challenge. So let me repeat and summarize the status of the disaster waste treatment. And I would say three strategies in terms of the disaster waste management. In the first stage, we secure the people's lives and conduct rescue work. Therefore, debris obstruct, ob obstructing roads was cleared by the Japanese Self-Defense Force and other organizations, for example. In the second stage, sanitary issues were addressed to secure the people's health conditions. Therefore, disaster debris was transported to temporary storage sites. In some cases, we used the elementary school playgrounds as temporary storage sites. In other cases, we used rice fields, which were rented from the farmers who owned them, who owned or uh, public parks. In the third stage, we started to uh, conduct a treatment and utilization to reduce the amount of the waste that needed to be dumped in landfills. Therefore, mixtures of various materials were separated for recycling. And as I mentioned, the soil was uh, the, the expected to be used as construction materials. The same is true for the concrete as well. Concrete accounted for one third of the disaster debris. But since concrete waste was, has been already been reused before, it was not a big challenge to use concrete waste from the disaster waste as well. Unlike uh, soil waste, which has never been used in uh, such large quantities before, as I mentioned. So there were some cases in the past which a small amount of waste soils were used, but uh, using uh, such amount of uh, uh, soils was the first case. So next I'd like to explain why treatment was chosen instead of uh, the landfill and dumping. First is, uh, of course, uh, the large amounts uh, waste, which was uh, 11 times a larger uh, waste generation of uh, uh, Iwate Prefecture and 90 times uh, uh, larger, uh, which is equivalent to uh, annual waste generation in Miyagi Prefectures. Second, land filling is not preferable because organic contents of the soil waste would make it stable and not unstable. A further unexpected fires might occur. The land filling of a disaster the soil has been conducted before after the, the, the 1923 Great Kanto earthquake, but at the time, no problem were reported. So the separation, treatment, and recycling were preferable. That is the first, uh, the third, third uh, uh, point, uh, because uh, even uh, uh, the waste will be subjected to incineration. We need a proper, proper separation to have uh, efficient incineration, uh, because we have uh, inorganic fractions. Uh, the incineration efficiency will become uh, very low. 
and some is mostly incineration plants, so we do not accept uh, a large size materials. So therefore, the, the, the treatment is required and the national government decided to complete these uh, disaster waste treatment uh, within three years in uh, most places uh, by using a national budgets uh, because of the required uh, long term treatment and also based on the experience of the previous uh, earthquake and uh, uh, companies uh, joined uh, and contributed uh, this uh, task. Uh, the, the, this slide is showing that uh, the, how the waste, uh, disaster waste uh, is treated. First, they are collected and transported to the, the, the temporary storage sites and the lab separation was conducted. And advanced separation was conducted at the secondary storage sites. And these works were completed in three years in the most places. And we obtained uh, the separated fraction through these uh, processes, such as the metals, uh, wood chips, crushed concrete, and hazardous materials. We covered the soil and swells, and which were subjected to the recycle utilization using the cement manufacturing as a raw materials, incineration, and uh, landfills. This slide is showing the basic flow in the different ways. As I mentioned, we conducted the collection transportation and the separation was conducted at primary storage sites, which uh, counted uh, more than 300 sites at the maximum at the time of the disaster. And uh, secondary storage and treatment sites were uh, assigned one or two places for each municipalities. And uh, advanced separation was conducted. After that, the incineration was uh, conducted uh, either by existing facilities or temporary plants. And uh, also, uh, the materials, some materials are uh, used in the cement manufacturing. And the final is subjected to the recycle. Or, or dumping. Okay, the, these photos, uh, how the, the, the waste treatment uh, looks like. And uh, this photo is uh, the, the, the entrance at the secondary storage sites. Uh, they check uh, the weight of each vehicles because uh, the payment is uh, based on the, the how much waste uh, tr treated. So, Therefore, this kind of process is uh, very important. Uh, and uh, this is how they are doing uh, the separation manually by using uh, operation vehicles, as well as uh, the, the, the human uh, picking up uh, the valuable items. Also, we have uh, introduced uh, the some separation machines like uh, rotation screens, uh, uh, uniaxial crushing machine, or wind separation machines to separate the heavy materials and lighter materials. The basic idea uh, of a separation of the dust and debris is uh, the separation by size and waste uh, weight. So therefore, rotating screen worked very well, as well as uh, wind separation was uh, uh, used to separate by based on the weight. And these machines have a capacity in terms of the size. Therefore, sometimes uh, we need uh, uh, this kind of crushing machine in advance. And manual separation is also effective they are uh, responsible uh, for each materials uh, to pick up. So, so therefore, we have uh, very clean uh, separated uh, materials. This is uh, another photos, uh, a crushing of concrete debris. You see the three mountains of uh, concrete debris, and you recognize that a uh, large uh, particles or cobbles, concrete debris. And uh, after crushing by using these crushing machines, you see rather uh, smaller and uh, uniform concrete debris. 
uh, which may be uh, uh, effectively uh, used in many applications. So in this country, Japan, we have uh, the long experiences uh, of the concrete utilization of concrete debris. And according to the statistics of the Japanese government, uh, 99 percentage of the concrete waste is uh, treated and uh, reused in other applications, including uh, the, the concrete aggregates. So we apply these technologies again for the disaster debris, uh, concrete uh, waste. And also we have applied uh, the separation techniques uh, for the, uh, the, the disaster the soil dominant stockpile, disaster waste uh, soil mixtures, but we do, do not have uh, such experiences. So that was a big challenge. So here we have uh, the soil dominant stockpiles and you see some waste of fractions, but uh, after uh, the treatment of a rotating screen, we are able to separate the clean soils from the uh, separated uh, waste materials. Okay, so the, this uh, drawing is showing the how entire system looks like. And uh, this treatment system is uh, uh, the, the, uh, the example in the Ishinomaki city, uh, which had uh, the, the, the largest uh, amount of a uh, disaster waste. Uh, and they have uh, used uh, the 50 hectare uh, area of uh, one yard and six hectare another yard. And they have installed uh, several types of machines I have introduced and uh, operation vehicles to treat a huge amount of uh, disaster debris. And uh, these machines in Yadoe were utilized for the separation of the waste materials, while another yard uh, used for the storage. And you see these uh, five uh, big facilities, uh, which uh, looks like uh, elephants. But they are not elephants, but the incineration plants. They are temporary incineration plants installed only for the disaster waste treatment. And the total incineration capacity was the second highest, largest all over the Japan at the time. So you can imagine how large the, these facilities are and how large the entire system is. And surprisingly, they, 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 this worked only for uh, uh, one or two years because uh, disaster waste treatment was uh, completed in three years. So it worked on in a very short period, but government has decided that these facilities were necessary, uh, even if only for the short period, because uh, these facilities are effective for the uh, disaster uh, recovery. Okay, so let me talk about the recovered soils. So the, the, we have uh, the waste soil mixtures, either the soil dominant uh, uh, mixtures or waste dominant mixtures. And after crushing and separation using equipment, uh, we obtained uh, soil fractions separated from uh, waste fractions. And uh, first, we expected uh, to use these materials uh, for the recovery works, such as uh, use in the embankments. And the bottom uh, left graph is uh, the, the, the how these soils looks like. And we have conducted uh, several different uh, types of experiments. And uh, this is uh, the compaction uh, curves. And uh, in the, the, the compression curves, uh, you might recognize that the, the, the higher dry density means a good quality of the soils and the lower uh, dry density is stand for the poor quality of the, the soils. So we prefer these soils while we hesitate to use uh, these soils. So 
actually we had variety of soils uh, ranging from a very, very good quality of the soils to a rather poor quality of soils. And uh, we recognize that uh, the, these soils are coming from a soil dominant stockpiles, while these poor soils uh, are from a waste dominant stockpiles. So therefore, uh, we had better to classify these soils. Uh, therefore, the, 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 the good soils uh, may be uh, avoided to be uh, mixed with uh, the bad soils. We had better to classify good soil is good, bad soil is bad, but some, without Without uh, these classifications, even good soils may be categorized together with the bad soils. So this is what we have uh, done in uh, the Iwate uh, prefecture government. Uh, yes, here and uh, the, this uh, this uh, local one of the local government, which uh, was uh, severely damaged by the earthquake. They classified into uh, three categories uh, by the qualities, uh, which are the recovered soils class A, recovered soils class B, and separated fine fractions, uh, which uh, may not be used uh, as uh, the recovered uh, soils for the utilization. Uh, so uh, according to these uh, classifications, the class A soils is uh, uh, was, uh, was uh, strategically uh, sold out fast, and then also class soil B, uh, class B soil is also utilized in a good way. And uh, for the to establish uh, these classifications. The, we, our research group, as well as the Japanese Geotechnical Society, contributed to the, the classification, standardization, and uh, stand, the strategic utilization of uh, uh, these materials. So that's a kind of a uh, uh, good example of the, the strong collaboration between the local governments and uh, academia and uh, public uh, institutions. Okay. Uh, this is uh, the how recovery works uh, looks like. Uh, this is one example of uh, Sendai City. And at the time, national and local governments decided to create uh, the recovery plan mostly using uh, the embankments constructions because uh, embankments are needed to grow uh, the seaside forest effectively to mitigate the tsunamis as i mentioned uh, yes uh, at the time of a disaster this time the seaside forest worked very well but because of the elevation uh, many of the uh, trees were attacked by tsunami like a recent Takata city. So therefore, uh, they have decided to have uh, the, 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 the trees over the embankments to have a, a better situation, uh, better uh, uh, if efficiency to reduce that tsunami energy. And also they have decided to uh, create the road and highways over the embankments to provide uh, the, the, the efficiency of the another uh, opportunity to reduce the tsunami energy and also the space for the evacuation of the surrounding people. And residential area must be constructed uh, uh, at the uh, elevated uh, locations. So the, 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 this is uh, the original uh, situation of the affected area uh, before tsunami disaster. And uh, this uh, seaside forest worked 
uh, to some extent, but uh, damaged. And these houses are also damaged. So therefore, the recovery works, uh, the, we have decided to have uh, the, the embankments uh, for seaside forest, as well as uh, the new residential areas or uh, the uh, industrial areas. Also, we cut the mountains uh, to create the another residential areas. So in terms of the embankment, the originally the, we estimated uh, that the requirement quantity was uh, the, the, the more than uh, uh, the, the 100 million cu uh, cubic meters. And we have uh, recovered the soils. We have recovered the soils. And the use of recovered soils was expected uh, but uh, there were competition among uh, other soils like uh, the excavated soils uh, to create the residential area after cutting the mountains. And also another new materials were uh, brought from other places. So the, the, the negotiations uh, among uh, the, 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 the related institutions and uh, the companies, and finally resulted in the use of uh, the recovered soils. And uh, yes, uh, that was a big, a big debate and a big negotiations, particularly in the, uh, the third year or fourth year after the completion of the uh, disaster uh, debris treatment. But the uh, important aspect is uh, the, the how the, the, uh, the harmonization among uh, the disaster debris treatment as well as the recovery works, recovery works. Recovery works need uh, the materials and the disaster treatment uh, generate the, the recovered materials. So we should have a good marriage, good combination between them. The, the, so the finally, the, the, this is uh, the situation or final situation in terms of the use of the recovered soils in uh, Iwate Prefecture, uh, which is one of the local government. And uh, yes, uh, the situation are the same uh, in other prefectures, uh, which are Miyagi Prefecture and the Fukushima Prefecture, there are three big prefectures and uh, the prefectures which I have contributed most is Iwate Prefecture. And there, the old uh, uh, recovered soils class A and class B were used for many applications. And uh, to achieve uh, this uh, goal, uh, we had, uh, uh, we need, needed uh, uh, very, uh, many, many uh, challenges. For example, we have created uh, model embankments constructed uh, by using uh, recovered soils and uh, to show how the constructions uh, can be conducted in the same way uh, to the traditional soils and also to conduct uh, the, the monitoring of the mechanical behaviors, as well as the, the environmental issues, such as uh, the, the leaching of uh, toxic elements uh, from the recovered soils. We had uh, large meters installed in these uh, embankments and uh, measure the, the, the concentrations of the, the shipped water and uh, found that uh, the no significant uh, problems compared to the traditional uh, traditional soils. Uh, not only the environmental issues, but also the uh, settlement, uh, which were monitored by using uh, these uh, settlement gauges. Finally, most people understood that uh, these recovered soils are the good materials and appropriately used 
uh, for many applications such as uh, farmland, uh, coastal forest embankment, so to uh, increase the uh, land level of a residential area for other uh, green parks or road embankments or backfields. So the, 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 let me summarize uh, my presentation this time. The, I have talked about recovered soils only, and uh, also I did not mention uh, in the, this issue in detail, but uh, fortunately most recovered soils have uh, sufficient properties and the quality is uh, to be used as uh, geomaterials uh, in terms of the, the strengths and physics, physical and chemical properties, which I did not mention in detail, but uh, you can uh, find uh, our publications uh, through the web page if you are interested. And uh, uh, these uh, results uh, contributed uh, uh, to the, the use of the recovered soils and uh, which resulted in um, uh, the disaster waste uh, acceler acceler accelerated the treatment and resulted in a completed in the three years in uh, Iwate and uh, Miyagi prefectures. And this achievement will be the actually is being utilized at this moment as well uh, for the future catastrophic disasters in other places as well. And also management of the nuclide contaminated soils caused by the Fukushima nuclear disaster, which I have mentioned earlier briefly. We have a huge amount of uh, uh, the, the, uh, the nuclear contaminated soils, which are currently stored in the temporary and the interim storage facilities. But we should consider the use of such soils, even they are contaminated, if the, the contamination and the radiation is uh, very, very low and uh, acceptable for the use in some other civil engineering facilities. So uh, this issue is what we have been discussing at this moment. And uh, also we have been discussing uh, how uh, to decommission the, the Fukushima uh, nuclear power plants. And there are several issues uh, of uh, geotechnical engineering a contribution, a contributions uh, to this issue. Uh, but uh, this is uh, out of uh, uh, the scope of today's talk. So the, the, if you, uh, we have opportunity, I would talk this issue uh, another chance. So therefore, uh, let me close uh, my presentation here and uh, Yes, uh, these are the references uh, which can be available from the website clearly. And uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, very kind attention. And uh, uh, you, uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, receive any questions if, if you have any questions or comments. Thank you very much for your attention, Amitra. Gracias. Thank you very much, Professor, for uh, your presentation. Uh, now we're open for uh, questions. If you uh, will, you can raise your hand or uh, you can type your questions in the in the chat window. Uh, I, I have received a couple of questions uh, directly on the chat window. What, one of them was um, you mentioned the uh, chemical, pro uh, sorry, the physical properties of the soils. Uh, were there any chemical properties uh, uh, chosen for the, for the uh, recovery of the, the use of the recovery soils? 
Yes, uh, there are two issues. One is uh, the, the, the amount of organic fractions. Organic fractions. If uh, organic fractions can be categorized into the, uh, the chemical properties. If we have an organic fraction uh, exist, uh, the, the, this fraction might be deteriorated and uh, the, if we use uh, this material, uh, the, the ground uh, will become unstable due to the biodegradation. So we had uh, minimized uh, this kind of effects. So therefore we had better to reduce the amount of uh, organic fractions. So therefore we conducted uh, separation measures uh, to uh, separate uh, the soil materials from uh, organic fractions, particularly uh, wood materials or other organic fractions. That is uh, the, the one of the answers. Another aspect is uh, the, the contaminants. There are several contaminants uh, of concerns and most of the soils may not have uh, contaminants, but some soils might have uh, contaminations. So therefore, what they have done at the, the East of Japan earthquake was uh, that they tested uh, the recovered soils at uh, the certain intervals, certain frequency uh, to secure uh, the, the no contamination exists. And uh, uh, the, all the chemical compositions are acceptable levels. That was uh, what they have uh, conducted. Otherwise, uh, people hesitate to accept uh, the use of uh, such materials. So we need, uh, we need uh, proof, we need evidence so that uh, the utilization was uh, promoted. Thank you very much for your comments. There is a very, uh, second very short question. Uh, why three years? Pardon me? Why three years? I think I think the question goes oh, uh, in regards years, to why, why did Japan chose three years as the time frame for uh, cleaning up uh, or reusing the soil? Yes, uh, it's there are several discussions, but uh, uh, one example is a Kobe earthquake. Uh, we had a big earthquake which hit uh, Kobe City, uh, which occurred in uh, 1995, and at that time. We had uh, also huge amount of disaster debris, and we they worked very hard at the time as well, and uh, they have completed uh, the disaster debris treatment in three years. So yes, the the magnitude of the disaster is larger this time compared to Kobe earthquake, and also the generation of the disaster debris is also larger compared to Kobe earthquake. But uh, uh, according to these uh, experiences and also the, the according to the capacity of the, the resources, uh, human resources and resources of the companies, resources, no, local resources of the equipments, or any other resources, and also the demands of the, the uh, recovery works. If uh, the disaster debris treatment is extended uh, four years or five years, the recovery works also uh, extended. So therefore the government has decided uh, uh, into three years, three years. So it might be short, it might be short. Uh, the 3.5 years or four years might be uh, considerable, but they have decided uh, uh, three years. And actually there are some cities or municipalities to extend uh, several months after three years. So that was acceptable. So the government watched uh, the, the by town by town. Uh, so they worked very smoothly. And this is a good lesson. If we have a, a good, uh, uh, if we, we have, we, we would have a, another big disaster. I'm sure that we'll have a, uh, the, 
big debate. And uh, I think a government will decide the duration of treatment by location by locations. Some location uh, will be decided in three years. Other locations can be uh, completed in five years if uh, they have uh, less stress uh, for the uh, coming from a disaster debris treatment. So the, the, yes, uh, this is a good point. Why three years? Why three years? That's, that's, uh, uh, that's what uh, I can answer at this moment. We have a, a, another comment and a question from uh, uh, Professor Vedriñana. For uh, disaster prone countries like Peru, the risk to have a large amount of soil debris after a disaster is very high. Uh, in the case of Peru, as a developing country, I do not think we have facilities to recover a large amount of soil debris. How can a city or local government prepare for such a big soil recovery plan after a disaster? Uh, what, what would you suggest mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to, a, to a developing country like mm -hmm. Peru after your experience? Yes, uh, the, the, yes uh, the, actually the, the system uh, equipment or system uh, were developed uh, for the disaster waste treatment, but uh, there were the combinations of uh, the existing facilities. So the, as I, as I mentioned, the, the most of the facilities, uh, the, let me, yes, uh, most of the equipment are the traditional equipments. So the, what uh, I can say is uh, these facilities uh, uh, have been utilized in a normal time as well, because uh, we try to reduce the waste and we try to recover the materials from the normal time. So we can apply the idea, uh, technology or equipment uh, which are used uh, in the normal time uh, for the, the disaster time as well. If uh, we only dump the waste, uh, we are not able to do uh, the disaster waste uh, treatment. Uh, so the management of uh, the waste management is in the normal time is also uh, important. But uh, this, in Japan also, it was uh, the first, uh, almost the first experience. We have never had uh, such experience to recover uh, such huge amount of uh, recovered soils. So the, the, yes, uh, there, there were challenges. There were challenges required. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Berinana uh, Sensei. Thank you very much. Do we have uh, any any other question from from the public? I I do have one professor uh, connected to what uh, Professor Bedriñana uh, mentioned. Um, of course, we cannot go back in time. Uh, this was a huge disaster and we, we cannot always uh, prepare for large scale disasters like this, but we should have something ready. Um, if you could go back in time and, and, and tell the government you should have this ready, uh, what would you have liked to have ready in Japan? Uh, I'm sure not these huge installations because that's not possible, of course, uh, but uh, what would have made all this work easier if Japan had it ready ahead of time? Yes, uh, the, the, mm, the, to me, most important uh, situation is uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the prediction over the step. So if we have a, the place location of uh, the disaster affected area, we only see the disaster debris at the affected site, but uh, 
uh, if uh, you can predict the, the future steps, uh, for example, how to collect, how to treat, how to utilize, or how to dump, we can uh, imagine uh, how much equipment or how many people uh, should be involved in these uh, uh, projects. And also, uh, the issue in the affected area is not only the disaster debris treatment, but also secure the people's life, uh, secure the, the residential places, and also provide uh, the, the working uh, opportunities at the affected sites. So, so the collaboration with uh, the uh, many sectors are important. So this is, this is uh, the, the, the important issue. And uh, for this, the, the strong governmental leadership might work, but uh, uh, the very intelligent uh, and uh, uh, brave uh, people who are working at the bottom uh, situations in uh, many sections also important and they should uh, uh, communicate and collaborate it with uh, the people from uh, other sections to create uh, uh, the, the other results. So one plus one should become a, a, a not a two, but a three or a four at the time of the, uh, the disaster recovery. That's what I have learned. And uh, I think uh, the people have worked very well at the time of uh, East uh, Japan earthquake and tsunami. And also we have learned. So we, if we have uh, the similar uh, disaster, a similar scale, we will do uh, better, uh, but uh, we might have a, another problem if we have a better solution. Thank you, Flores Sensei. I hope we don't have another large scale disaster like this one, Professor. Um, being uh, eight and uh, seven minutes, we are running a little bit late. Uh, I want to thank you, Professor Katsumi, for your time, uh, for your uh, kind of explanation of how uh, Japan managed uh, this, uh, taking just three years to, to manage uh, these soil uh, and debris materials. Uh, I, I do believe that's something that unfortunately we cannot achieve uh, in Peru. But uh, the idea of uh, being ready and uh, learning from uh, other countries' experiences, mm -hmm. I hope uh, can uh, lead us to uh, work on disaster preparedness and to understand how disaster preparedness is so important, uh, being ready. We don't know what disaster is going to uh, affect, uh, but uh, we must uh, get our systems and people ready for uh, anything that comes ahead. Thank you very much, Professor Katsumi, in the name of uh, everybody here at the University of uh, Ingeniería y Tecnología uh, in Peru. And uh, once again, I hope we can meet uh, again in the future in Peru, uh, once again, and uh, definitely in Japan in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you very much, Flores Sensei. And uh, thank you very much to all the, the delegates. Thank you. And take care. Good, uh, good night. Yeah, good night around here. Yes. Thank you very much, and have a good day over there, Professor. Thank you. Have a good dinner. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you uh, also to everybody who has uh, joined this uh, webinar, and uh, see you in the next one. Thank you.